If you're an athlete, you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down. After all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. Well, hello there, folks. Today, we're going to be visiting Oregon, a state that I admittedly know nothing about. During my research, I learned a lot about this state, and I now am excited to talk about it and even more excited to probably visit this state this year. I have to see what's going on there. Today, we're going to navigate through the tangled web of the Lafayette Curse, venture fearlessly into the shadowed depths of the Shanghai Tunnels, and then we will attempt to unravel the secrets behind Polybius. Now, I'm an avid gamer, or at least I was before. I was married and had a kid and had a job. And oh my god, I'm not a gamer anymore. I probably haven't sat down and played a video game for more than 15 minutes in probably almost a decade. But I still consider myself a gamer, damn it. I bought Super Mario Wonder recently, and I've played it for approximately, probably 20 minutes probably, since I bought it. And I bought it the day it came out, so do the math. Um, yes, yeah, so when I found out that there was a video game that had folklore surrounding it and mystery behind it that originated in Oregon, that's something that had to get thrown on the list. So sit tight and prepare yourselves for a journey through the legends and mysteries that have left their mark on the lore of Oregon. Do you believe in ghosts? Join me on a journey through America's dark and haunted past as we explore the folklore and ghost stories that have been passed down for generations. What scares you? Let's find out. I'm Christopher Feinstein, and this is Haunted American History. The town of Lafayette, Oregon, has long been shrouded in chilling whispers of a curse. Said to have originated in the 1800s when a woman who was accused of witchcraft... Let's pause for a second. I think we can all agree that that's how most of these legends started. A woman back in that time could literally have been seen doing anything, and the town folks would have been like, Oh, it's a witch! Well, as you can guess, she met a gruesome fate at the hands of the fearful town folk. Legend has it that before her execution, she cast a spell upon the town, foretelling its destruction by fire, but not once, not twice, but thrice. Ooh, I've always wanted to say thrice. Yes. And indeed, Lafayette has experienced two devastating fires since that fateful day, leaving those who are aware of the curse to wonder when the third and final fire will consume their beloved town. Adding an air of eerie mystique, tales persist of the ghostly apparition of the accused woman haunting the desolate corners of the town cemetery, forever tethered to her tragic end. However, as with many legends, the truth behind this ominous tale are far less supernatural, though they are no less tragic. The year is 1885. Richard Marple his mother Anna and his wife Julia sought a fresh start in Louisiana after leaving behind their previous home in Corvallis. Richard's dreams of finding stable employment were quickly dashed, forcing him into a treacherous path of crime and suspicion. Rumors swirled about his involvement in a string of robberies that had plagued the area, casting a shadow over his already tarnished reputation. Within the unfolding narrative of Lafayette's history, Another key figure emerges, David Corker, a local shop owner who unwittingly became entangled in a web of deceit and violence. It was in November of 1886 that tragedy struck. As Corker was discovered, brutally murdered, his life snuffed out by the merciless swing of an axe. The ensuing chaos led Sheriff Harris to bring Richard in for questioning, suspecting him to be intimately linked to this heinous crime. 
Richard denied any involvement in Corker's demise, even going so far as to disparage the victim during his interrogation. However, damning evidence seemed to point directly at him. Bloodstained garments, a gruesome testament to his guilt that were discovered in his possession. In addition, tools capable of breaching the shop's defenses were found concealed within Richard's home. Undeterred by this, Richard clung to his claim that the evidence had been planted by the corrupt sheriff's office, a desperate attempt to establish his innocence. As the investigation unfolded, neither Richard's mother nor his wife offered any alibi to support his claims of being elsewhere during the murder. Their silence painted a damning portrait, and on April 9, 1887, Richard was convicted of first-degree murder. Anna, his mother, faced charges as an accomplice, but was ultimately released due to lack of concrete evidence against her. The date of November 11th, hey, that's my wedding anniversary, 1887, marked the somber climax of this tragic tale. The day Richard Marple met his fate at the hands of the hangman's noose, executed beside the imposing walls of the county jail. A crowd of 30 witnesses gathered, their eyes fixated upon the unfolding tragedy. Sheriff Harris, determined to ensure Richard's demise, ordered that the black hood be placed over his head. In a last-ditch effort to divide the inevitable, Richard's voice echoed through the crowd as he cried out in desperation, Murder! May God judge you all! But fate had other plans. As the trapdoor swung open beneath him, the knot securing the noose slipped beneath Richard's chin, denying him the swift release of a broken neck. Instead, he endured a torturous 18 minutes of slow strangulation before succumbing to death's embrace. It is true that during those harrowing moments of Richard's execution, his anguished mother Anna unleashed a chilling proclamation upon the town that had condemned her son. Her voice, filled with grief and anger, rang out, foretelling Lafayette's fiery fate and a future bereft of prosperity. Richard found his final resting place in the hallowed grounds of Oddfellow's Masonic Cemetery. While Anna, burdened with the weight of her son's tragic demise, sought solace in Jackson County, where she spent the remainder of her days before being laid to rest. In the years that followed Anna's departure from Lafayette, the very home that they once shared fell victim to an unexplained collapse. Yeah, the house just fell over. Amidst the wreckage, a bloodstained axe, the instrument of David Cocker's brutal murder, was discovered within it, a haunting reminder of the past. Speculation abounds as to Anna Maple's true nature. Was she truly a witch or perhaps some sort of mysterious gypsy? But as history reveals, her remains were not interred in Lafayette's sacred cemeteries, casting doubts that her ghost haunts its shadowed corners. Though skeptics may dismiss the notion of a curse, attributing the town's fires to hazards from an era where flammable materials were prevalent, there remains an undeniable sense of foreboding in Lafayette's collective consciousness. The ominous specter of the curse lingers, leaving residents and visitors alike to ponder their own mortality and the fragility of their cherished town. As they gaze upon the charred remnants of their past and brace themselves for an uncertain future, they cannot help but wonder, will Lafayette succumb to its fiery fate once more? Well, only time will reveal the truth. The truth that lies hidden within the walls of this town's haunted history. During the 1980s, an era when youthful gamers eagerly flocked to arcades, clutching their precious quarters ready to immerse themselves in the pixelated wonders of legendary games like Pac-Man and Donkey Kong. I admit that I was one of those kids. Maybe not in the 80s, well maybe the late 80s. I was, I was born in the early 80s, so the Pac-Man and Donkey Kong cabinets really wasn't my thing, but I do remember when around the corner from my house it was a little convenience store called Doug's. And they got a Street Fighter cabinet. 
well, arcade. And I literally spent countless hours, countless afternoons there with my cousins and people from the neighborhood just playing Street Fighter. And it's one of my fondest childhood memories. Well, there existed a mysterious cabinet, a video game that stood apart from the colorful ones that adorned Portland, Oregon's gaming sanctuaries. And its name was Polybius. Shrouded in an unmarked black cabinet, this arcade game quietly beckoned players with its mesmerizing gameplay of geometric patterns and shapes dancing across the screen. Little did they know that within this seemingly innocent facade lay the dark secret, a dangerous allure that would grip their minds and bodies, leaving them sick and disoriented. Whispers of government agents manipulating this game to control unsuspecting stoles only added to the mystique. Yet the biggest mystery of all was whether Polybius ever truly existed in the first place. Legend has it that in 1981, Polybius stealthily infiltrated the soda-stained rugs of Portland's arcades, luring gamers into its clutches. Upon pressing the start button, players were transported into a hypnotic trance, their addiction to this game intensifying with each passing moment. It was said that these hapless victims experienced memory loss, seizures, blackouts, and even hallucinations. The allure of Polybius seemed to come from its name itself, a connection to a Greek philosopher who devised the Polybius Square, a tool used for encrypting messages. The name also held another intriguing meaning, many lives in Greek. As rumors spread and tales grew more elaborate, Reports surfaced of government workers dressed in ominous black suits making clandestine visits to arcades. Instead of merely collecting quarters like any other arcade attendant, they were allegedly extracting data from the machines. The combination of these sightings and the disturbing effects experienced by players only fueled suspicions that something sinister was afoot. The whispers of a connection between Polybius and the infamous MKUltra experiments conducted by the CIA to uncover methods of mind control through hypnosis and drugs, well, that sent shivers down the spines of both Greek scholars and gaming enthusiasts alike. Despite the haunting tales that surrounded Polybius, the first public record of its existence emerged in February 2000 on coinop.org, a comprehensive database dedicated to arcade games. This revelation provided the foundation for the myths and legends that continued to swirl around the game. A single image of Polybius's start screen accompanied this discovery, presenting a stark, minimalistic display. Large letters boldly proclaimed the game's title, while a seemingly insignificant line of text, 1981, Sinisloskin Incorporated, hinted at a copyright date and game developer. However, upon further investigation, neither the copyright nor the developer could be verified. In fact, the FBI itself confirmed that no copyright for Polybius was ever filed. The German translation of Sinisloskin means mind erasing, which adds another layer of intrigue to this already perplexing puzzle. While the legends of Polybius painted a treacherous plot unfolding within Portland's arcades, Reality offered a different perspective. The soulless black cabinets that housed Polybius were simply test machines for new games, awaiting their final artwork before wide release. Reports of players falling ill during extended gaming sessions were not exclusive to Polybius, but they were rather common occurrences in arcades and still today. The story of Brian Morrow a 12-year-old who suffered stomach pains after playing Asteroids for an astonishing 28 hours straight, dispelled some of the supernatural aura surrounding Polybius. 28 hours? Jesus Christ, kid. That's the, I, I take my hat off to you. It turned out that Morrow's ailment was not a result of a mind-altering trance, but rather an overindulgence in soda, which wreaked havoc on his young stomach. Listen, ah... Uh, Back when I was, you know, I don't know, late teens, early 20s, and Call of Duty, one of the first Call of Duties for like 
X, I think it was like World at War came out. And uh, me and my buddies waited online in GameStop, outside of GameStop. I remember it was, it was frigid. And before the ride home, we all stopped at the, the 24-hour grocery store that was by our house and loaded up on soda and like ramen noodles and chips. So, listen, kid, I get it. Because I wasn't right for a week after that. Ah, those were the days. To be young again, if I tried to eat ramen noodles now, I think I would, I would literally just die. Those little square packages and all that sodium. Oof. But what a way to go. There was a similar report back then that accounted an experience of a 14-year-old boy named Michael Lopez, who succumbed to a migraine and nausea after an intense session of Tempest, a game with graphics that bore resemblance to the rumored pixels of Polybius. These incidents served as a reminder that reality often intertwines with urban legend, blurring the lines between fact and fiction. Now, the presence of government agents within arcades, often mistaken for the figures associated with Polybius, was not as clandestine as initially believed. Law enforcement frequently planted cameras and surveillance equipment inside of arcade machines. Some of the more popular games could hold hundreds of dollars in quarters, so they were hoping to catch some criminals in the act. Also, the arcades themselves were not solely havens for innocent gaming. There were also hotspots for gambling and drug dealing. And it was within this complex web of reality and deception that the foundation of Polybius' infamous status was laid. Despite the skepticism surrounding its existence, Polybius has managed to leave an indelible mark on pop culture. The game has appeared in various television shows, such as The Simpsons and Marvel's Loki, serving as a subtle nod to its enduring legacy. The urban legend of Polybius also inspired two real video games that bear its name. In 2007, Rogue Synapse developed a free game that is sought to simulate the rumored gameplay of Polybius, while Lamasoft released their own version of Polybius for the PlayStation 4 in 2017, drawing inspiration from the legend without attempting to replicate any specific gameplay elements. So did Polybius ever truly exist? Despite the compelling tales and the enduring myths, all signs point to no. It seems that this mysterious game exists solely within the realms of speculation, superstition, and imagination. Perhaps it's best to save your quarters for another one. One that does not carry the weight of this tantalizing, yet elusive, urban legend. In the bustling heart of downtown Portland, a vibrant allure of shops and restaurants beckons tourists from near and far. Yet unbeknownst to these visitors, a hidden world lies beneath their very feet, shrouded in mystery and forgotten by time. Deep beneath the surface, concealed within the labyrinth network of cobblestone streets, lies the secret of the city's past. For over a century and a half, Portland's oldest buildings have been connected by a series of subterranean tunnels, their existence known only to a select few. These age-worn passageways, crafted with meticulous precision, serve as a silent witness to a bygone era. It was the Chinese workers who toiled tirelessly during Chinatown's heyday, fashioning these tunnels as conduits that intertwined the basements of the city's buildings with the majestic Willamette River beyond. Originally conceived as a means to facilitate the swift transportation of goods, these tunnels served a practical purpose. As cargo ships docked along the river's edge, laden with treasures from distant lands, their precious cargo would be stored within the depths of these underground passages. With deft efficiency, the ship's crew would navigate the winding labyrinth, evading the chaos of inner city traffic and sparing themselves the burden of unloading directly amidst the bustling streets above. In this symbiotic dance between land and water, Portland flourished. Merchants reveled in the convenience of these tunnels, utilizing their basements as secure storehouses for their precious wares. The pulse of trade reverberated through the veins of Chinatown infusing its streets with an electric energy that attracted admirers far and wide. 
Yet, beneath this facade of commerce and prosperity lay a darker truth, concealed within the shadows of these secret corridors. Whispers permeated the air, hinting at a more clandestine use for these hidden passages. For within these walls, away from prying eyes, illicit dealings and activities took root. Rumors of underground gambling and opium dens swirled through the city's underbelly, painting a picture of a world far removed from the polished exterior above. As history told its story, the secret of Portland's underground tunnels persisted, only known to those who dared to venture into their depths. Today, as tourists traverse the sunlit streets above, oblivious to the secrets buried beneath, the echoes of the past resonate within these ancient passageways, reminding us that every city holds stories untold, waiting to be discovered by those willing to listen. In the 19th century, Portland stood as a modest town, its size bellied by the bustling activity that thrived within its borders. Nestled on the banks of the Willamette River, it boasted a formidable port, its deep waters welcoming a steady stream of cargo ships, their weary hulls laden with treasures from far-flung lands. These vessels, emblematic of tireless maritime voyages that spanned months across the vast expanse of the Pacific, found relief in this haven before unloading their precious cargo onto the docks. Yet, an urgency pervaded the air within this fleeting moment of tranquility. The sailors who manned these imposing ships knew all too well the fleeting nature of their rest. Time slipped through their fingers like sand in an hourglass, leaving them with a mere sliver of liberty before they were once again bound by duty and the call of the open sea. In this brief interlude of liberty, many sought solace in the dimly lit bars that line the streets, their spirits thirsting for release after enduring the relentless rhythm of life at sea. However, not all sailors sought solace in revelry. Some harbored fears that surpassed the bounds of mere exhaustion or thirst for adventure. The specter of disease and debilitating injury haunted their thoughts, casting a shadow over their dreams of distant horizons. For these men, the allure of abandoning their lives at sea grew irresistible amidst the flickering lights of Portland saloons. And so it was that sea captains found themselves faced with unexpected dilemmas, vacancies left by those who had chosen to forsake the treacherous waters. Time pressed upon them relentlessly, and they had no choice but to quickly fill these crucial positions if they were to honor their commitments and set sail once more. It turns out that enticing prospective sailors to embark on long, perilous voyages proved to be a daunting task. Shock. In this climate of desperation, a sinister undercurrent coursed through the city's veins. Crooked captains, driven by their insatiable hunger for profit and indifference to human lives, resorted to devious means to replenish their depleted crew. For a mere sum of $50 per head, they hired men to Shanghai, unsuspected replacements. This vile practice became synonymous with the very name that now echoes through the annals of Portland's history. The Shanghai Tunnels. These subterranean labyrinths hidden beneath the city streets became the grim backdrop for this nefarious trade. A network of interconnected passages whispered tales of stolen lives and shattered dreams. Within their damp and musty confines, the unsuspecting victims would find themselves ensnared, their hopes of a different future cruelly extinguished. And so, as the sailors carousd above, unaware of the horrors lurking beneath their feet, these tunnels bore witness to the tragic consequences of greed and desperation. The Shanghai tunnels serve as a haunting reminder of a bygone era, where the pursuit of profit often overshadowed the value of human life. They stand as a testament to the resilience of those who dare to challenge the treacherous waters and an enduring symbol of the sacrifices made in the name of maritime adventure. In the shadowy corners of Portland's bustling bars, saloons, and taverns, a nefarious group of men roamed, their eyes scanning the crowd for vulnerable prey. Known as Shanghaiers, they sought out young, able-bodied men who were alone, their pockets filled with promise of a quick buck. Patiently biding their time, 
They waited until their targets were rendered defenseless by the intoxicating embrace of liquor. Then, with swift precision, they struck. Unleashing a sudden burst of violence, the Shanghaiers would incapacitate their victims. They would render them unconscious before dragging them through a network of tunnels. These subterranean labyrinths snaked their way towards the docks, their dark corridors concealing a sinister secret. It was here that the abducted men would find themselves, trapped on board ships bound for distant lands. Yet amid the despair and desperation that permeated these clandestine operations, stories of survival emerged. Some brave souls managed to escape the clutches of their captors, their tales echoing through the streets of Portland. As rumors spread about the Shanghai's treachery, men became increasingly cautious when venturing into the dimly lit establishments that had once offered solace and camaraderie. Faced with dwindling opportunities for abduction, the savvy Shanghai's shifted their focus onto a new unsuspecting target, women. Lone females would often frequent bars in search of companionship or relief from their daily struggles. They unknowingly were walking into a trap. Many establishments had cunningly concealed trap doors, ready to be sprung upon unsuspecting victims. Once ensnared in the tunnels below, escape became almost impossible. Prostitution rings seized upon this opportunity, using the tunnels as holding cells for groups of women destined for a life of captivity. Within these grim confines, they languished for agonizing periods as their captors secured buyers beyond the reaches of Portland. Not limited to the realm of human trafficking, the Shanghai tunnels became a conduit for a myriad of illicit activities. Chinese gangsters, their conflicting factions vying for power within Chinatown, utilized the hidden passageways to smuggle immigrants, contraband goods, and dangerous drugs. The establishments that dotted the city's underbelly, brothels, bars, and gambling dens, eagerly received these deliveries through their own private tunnels and trapdoors. This intricate web of trickery shielded them from the prying eyes of law enforcement, ensuring their lucrative operations remained intact. When prohibition gripped the nation, the Shanghai tunnels underwent a metamorphosis, transforming into an underground expressway for bootleggers seeking to quench the insatiable thirst for alcohol. Ships moored on the Willamette River offloaded their contraband cargo, which was then transported through the labyrinth of tunnels to bars scattered across Portland. Hotels, taverns, and speakeasies relied on these secret passages leading to the Shanghai Tunnels, allowing them to conduct their illegal trade away from the watchful eye of authorities. Police raids on these establishments were commonplace during this era, disrupting daily operations and forcing bar owners to resort to desperate measures. Deep within the dark recesses of the tunnels, they stashed their precious alcohol supply, evading arrest and preserving their livelihoods. Hidden doors became ubiquitous with bars during this time. As law enforcement descended upon these establishments in large numbers, criminals sought refuge within the secret chambers and concealed passages. With a deft sleight of hand, they vanished from sight, only to re-emerge once the coast was clear. The seamless integration of hidden infrastructure to these illicit enterprises ensured their survival in an increasingly hostile environment. Though police officers eventually caught wind of these subterranean hideouts, their attempt to search the expansive tunnels proved futile. Gangsters and bar owners had long since charted the underground realm, mapping out every nook and cranny where their ill-gotten gains could be safely stowed away. Today, the Shanghai tunnels stand as a haunting testament to the dark and troubled past of Portland. Once teeming with life and echoing with the cries of those ensnared within its depths, these tunnels now serve as a chilling tourist attraction, beckoning visitors to explore the remnants of a bygone era. During its heyday, an estimated 2,000 individuals fell victim to the cruel fate that waited them beneath Portland streets. Many perished within these subterranean confines, enduring beatings, starvation, and abandonment. The tunnels became a haven for gangs, who used them as hideouts and prisons for those who dared to betray their code of silence. In the inky blackness, disobedient members were left to languish, deprived of light and hope. Some were eventually retrieved, while others disappeared into the dark, their fate forever unknown. As modern-day explorers venture into this eerie underworld, they tread upon a path haunted by restless spirits. 
Travelers report an inexplicable chill that creeps along their skin, as if unseen eyes watch from the shadows. The apparition of an Asian man, affectionately named Sam by those who have encountered him, is said to roam the tunnels, his presence marked by flickering lights in bar basements and mischievous movements of objects in his wake. One tour guide recounts hearing a disembodied voice repetitively calling out Sam's name, its haunting echo reverberating through the dimly lit passages and sending shivers down guests' spines. While most encounters with the spectral inhabitants of the Shanghai tunnels are benign, some visitors have felt ghostly fingers brush against their shoulders or witnessed fleeting shadows darting out of sight. These playful spirits, who are known as the tricksters, delight in teasing and tantalizing those who dare to explore their realm. A gentle tug on the shirt or a whispered breath against one's ear. These are the hallmarks of their mischievous presence. Yet amid the tales of benign encounters, an undercurrent of unease lingers. Some visitors have reported feeling an unwelcome aura. A sensation that there are eyes upon them, eyes with malevolent intent. Whispers of childlike whistling have been heard just moments before unsuspecting souls are violently thrown to the ground their assailants invisible in the darkness. These chilling experiences serve as a stark reminder that caution is paramount when venturing into the depths of the Shanghai tunnels. This underground maze's dark passages that were once a haven for criminals and victims alike still hold secrets and dangers that should not be taken lightly. Explorers are advised to heed the guidance of their knowledgeable guides, to stay close and vigilant. For the black abyss that stretches before them is unforgiving. So if after listening to this, you choose to embark on your own journey of the Shanghai Tunnels, prepare yourselves for an adventure like no other. Embrace the darkness that envelops you, but tread carefully for the spirits that dwell within these hollowed halls are waiting, eager to make their presence known. Whether you seek historical intrigue or a brush with the supernatural, the Shanghai Tunnels offers an experience that will leave an indelible mark on your soul. So gather your courage, steal your nerves, and venture forth into the depths of this hidden world. But remember, in the heart of darkness, where secrets lie and spirits roam free, even the bravest souls must proceed with caution. As our journey through the folklore of Oregon comes to an end, we are reminded that beneath the surface of the mundane lies a plethora of stories. Stories that have been passed down through generation that refuse to be forgotten. The Lafayette Curse, the Shanghai Tunnels, and Polybius are more than mere tales. They are a piece of a collective imagination, woven into the very fabric of a state. I hope this glimpse into Oregon's mysterious side has sparked your curiosity, and also opened your eyes to the hidden history that surrounds us. So please, join me again as I continue to peel back the layers of time and uncover the haunting stories that lurk in the shadows. May the legends of Oregon forever ignite your curiosity and keep you ever watchful. For within these tales lies the essence of this land, waiting to be discovered by those who dare to seek it. Ooh, I like that. I'm going to use that more. I'm Christopher Feinstein, and this is Haunted American History. Music by Kevin McLeod. <laughs>